Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate being here. I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate all of you being in the room. Um, I, these are not um, technically disclosures. They don't relate to patient care, but I thought I should uh, be clear that I am um, uh, involved in a number of initiatives that all have to do with uh, measuring and addressing gender equity in our healthcare workplaces. I like to start with a warning because I've given a lot of talks on this topic before and generally somebody in the room gets upset. So I thought I would just kind of preempt that by explaining that for whatever reason, we are able to talk about a wide range of cognitive biases when it comes to clinical work, right? Does that feel comfortable? We talk about triage cueing and, um, you know, and all these things that influence our clinical work and nobody seems to get emotional or upset. And then we just talk about one other type of cognitive bias, another sort of patterned way of thinking. It just happens to be gender bias and people get super upset. And so um, I think it's helpful to just kind of acknowledge that discomfort and lean into it a little bit and question why it feels so uncomfortable and personal um, and own it a little bit. Is that fair? Okay. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about. I'm actually going to spend a good amount of time talking about gender disparities in physician careers. Um, I'll do some equity frequently asked questions, things that have come up as I spoke about this around the country, um, mechanisms or underpinnings of, of bias so we can sort of understand how these things play out. I will also weave in the problem of sexual harassment, which is a big problem in medicine right now, um, and then end with how and why medicine must respond to these issues. All right, so this is what is the problem for me um, and what sucked me into this work is if you look at um, numbers for, for women as we advance through healthcare, um, we're, uh, it's a leaky pipeline. We are losing women when it comes to leadership and when it comes to influence. And this is data from the AAMC. Um, and you know, we've achieved pretty much 50% of women um, in medical school and then we kind of hang on to you for residency and then at every step afterwards in academia, we just hemorrhage women. So um, only 38% of our faculty are female, 21% overall make full professor status, it's actually much lower in emergency medicine and then only about 16% of deans and this is even more so when you come to the very top hospital leadership. And so for a long while, I would just look at this and be like, where are the women going? And what was the answer? Do you guys know the answer to that? The commonly held answer? is that women are making different choices, right? They're making different choices that have to do with life, their lifestyle choices, and that's why we're losing women. And that, um, I kind of believe in that, you know, and then around the time I had my fourth kid, I was like, um, I, I didn't experience this, um, this complete loss of interest in uh, my career that I expected. I thought like I'd be so, Whatever was supposed to happen, I was supposed to be like just so engaged in my reproductive world that I would just lose all ambition. I was like, this is what we're told happens and it didn't happen. And I kept on coming back to this and thinking, I am not sure um, from the conversations that I've had from my own personal experience that this easy, cho this choice thing is really what's happening. Um, and then I read this. Um, so this is a report that came out from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine last year in June. Has anybody read this report? Even highlights from the report, Lally. Okay. So this is a 300 page report and I will tell you, it is the most riveting read. And I actually think I've read it all in one sitting and you think I'm kidding, but it is so interesting and devastating. Um, and if you don't want to read all, it's a free download and I highly recommend it for everybody in the room. If you don't want to read the whole thing, just read the highlights. So it's a number of sections and it has a summary and then it has a bunch of recommendations at the end. And I really like, I could not take my eyes off this thing because it is so bad. But let me summarize it for you. Um, basically, the report started with this premise that the true definition of sexual harassment should be very broad. Um, so they include gender harassment, which is not what we typically think of as being sexual harassment, um, but is, is included in the formal definition. So gender harassment is verbal and nonverbal behaviors that convey hostility, objectification, exclusion, or second class status. So very different than what we think of usually as like these overt sexually um, damaging behaviors, right? So um, that is the biggest group, actually the most common type of sexual harassment they included in this definition and it is what's included in validated measures of sexual harassment. And then they also included the things that you kind of think of as being sexual harassment typically, typically which is things like unwanted sexual attention, unwelcome verbal or physical sexual advances um, and it encompasses in assault and then sexual co coercion, which is um, what we think about often in academia, 
uh, when favorable professional educational treatment is conditioned on sexual activity. Okay, so when I talk about this report or the problem of sexual harassment, I'm actually talking about all these behaviors and all these kind of fall in the general experience of gender discrimination. All right, and so what this report found was that overall sexual harassment in the sciences is common and it is the worst in medicine. All right, so this is just among trainees. Um, and so they, they looked at undergraduate students in the sciences, graduate students in the sciences, and then these, um, I know you can't see in detail, but you can notice the spike in the columns for prevalence, these are medical students. And they found that across studies, about 50% of female medical students experience sexual harassment before they graduate. So before they even start their first jobs, they've experienced harassment. And so at one point somebody asked me to estimate the percentage of women in medicine who have experienced sexual harassment. I was like, just off the top of my head, my ballpark estimate would be 100%. Um, and this data really backs it up because if it's 50% before you've even started your first job, it is very likely to be, you know, due to cumulative experiences close to 100% over the course of your career. Um, other report conclusions. This is not changing over time. It is not getting better by itself. Again, worse than medicine due to multiple vulnerabilities. We don't just have colleagues and supervisors, but we have a wide range of hospital staff, many, many interactions, um, and also patients and their families, and we are a 24-7 business. And so just more opportunities um, and interactions to allow harassment to creep in. Largely, this is overlooked and tolerated by organizations. Um, we generally don't even measure it. So um, it is undermeasured. When we do measure it, it's poorly measured using questions that people make up out of the air rather than validated instruments. So it's very hard to know how to address this if we're not even detecting it routinely in our environments. Organizations in general are completely stalled on litigation. In other words, to the extent that they are addressing sexual harassment, it is entirely focused on protecting that organization from lawsuits, um, not on what is best for the workforce. And I will say there is a huge need for more research and data collection on what happens when the effects of gender are compounded by race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or any other individual factor. We don't know much, but from the little data that there is, any other factor added on to, to gender um, increases the, 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 um, the exposure to sexual harassment and the negative sequelae, all right? So that is just an acknowledgement that I wish we knew more, um, but it most certainly um, compounds the effects. The report does a really good job of talking about like really like the whole span of things that we're interested in here. So why does it happen? Um, what are the experiences? And then also what the downstream effects are that we care about. Um, and I'll just say when they talk about organizational antecedents, um, the factors that really make sciences and particularly medicine prone to sexual harassment are these. There are very steep hierarchies um, in which your advancement is really due to um, many times one or two people. And so if those are the people who are, who are uh, administering their harassment, it's very hard for that to be reported or changed. Um, in general, they're, uh, they're in organizations where there are few overall women in the workforce and few female leaders. So I will say again and again in this talk, this is not, gender bias is not a problem inflicted by men on women. However, there are characteristics of organizations in which inequities and harassment are much more likely. And when you have male predominance of the workforce and male predominance in leadership, that is part of the petri dish that makes an organization really fertile for harassment. Make sense? Okay, um, the effects on the careers of women can almost not be understated. Um, and so, um, let me back up, sorry. So um, there, there are a number of factors that make, um, uh, that make reporting sexual harassment very um, a career limiting thing. And so like I said, there's a steep hierarchy uh, steep dependence on advisors and mentors for career advancement. There's this system of meritocracy that doesn't account for declines in productivity and morale as a result of gender-based harassment. In other words, we have a setting in which we know there are negative impacts on your careers, and yet those negative impacts um, are, are completely discounted when we say what you should have accomplished in that time period. So it sort of becomes this like self-fulfilling thing of, 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 uh, of how women cannot get ahead. Um, and then um, the other thing that happens is that there are these whisper networks. And so um, although there is not much formal reporting of sexual harassment, we have these structures where um, there's a lot of kind of insider knowledge about 
who is toxic to work for, um, who's not a good employer of women. Those things are, are shared among women informally and it is good in one sense in that people know to avoid certain labs, certain directors and certain bosses, but it is bad in another sense in, with, in, in that those opportunities are then walled off for women um, because they are known to be damaging to them. And so it really limits the things that are available to you invisibly, right, compared to what's available to the general population. Um, so now the gender related outcomes. So um, these are the things that all have been documented in research on the impact of harassment uh, on workers over time. So decreased job satisfaction, withdrawal from your organization, um, which means sort of just less engagement, decreased orga organizational commitment, decreased productivity, um, and then measurable mental health sequelae, including stress, depression, and anxiety. What do these remind you of? Those are symptoms of what? Yeah, they, they sound a lot like, and certainly they sound a lot like depression, they sound a lot like burnout, right? I mean, these are things that, um, this is kind of like how you feel you can, what we are at risk for in emergency medicine over time, right, is sort of like uh, organizational withdrawal, uh, disengagement, um, sort of pulling yourself away from, um, from the work that you need to do, and then a lot of mental health sequelae. So this kind of sounds a lot like burnout to me. And what the, the report finds after this exhaustive review of the, of the literature is that sexual harassment has a stronger relationship with women's well-being than any other job-related stressor. So you think about all the stressors in medicine right now. I know you guys are feeling it. I mean, the, the high acuity of disease, the increase in comp complexity of our patient population, the high expectations from our patients and because of Dr. Google and all these things and, um, and the documentation requirements and the increasing regulatory requirements. I mean, we spend a lot of time thinking about wellness coming to medicine because there are so many things contributing to our workplace well-being. Um, this is a, a big, I think it is kind of like the issue for medicine right now. Um, but for women specifically, sexual harassment trumps all those things when it comes to workplace well-being, but we hardly ever talk about it. It is an invisible topic and that's why I'm here today. Um, so this is a piece I wrote for, uh, I co-wrote for New England Journal of Medicine in the fall. Um, the problem of sexual harassment is so hard to, um, to address if we don't address the overall experience of women in the healthcare workforce. Um, and so sexual harassment and gender inequity I see as completely interdependent, interlinked processes. And so my analogy for um, the New England Journal was uh, just as it is difficult to correct a potassium level in a magnesium depleted patient, interventions targeting sexual harassment are sure to fail in an environment that fosters the devaluation of women in every other sense. So what is this devaluation I'm talking about? And that's what we're gonna to move to next. Um, and I will say this is also an example of how if you have a favorite clinical teaching point, you can work that in as an analogy into any topic. So, um, so the devaluation is the gender-based career disparities in medicine. And I wanna run through this. And I know Derek Cass was here like a year and a half ago and talked about some of this stuff, right? Is that still kind of fresh in your heads? All right, so I'm gonna tear through this really fast. If anybody wants to slow down and talk about any of it, but I'm gonna assume that this is a refresher of something many of you heard a year ago. Is that okay? All right, so the number one easiest thing to talk about is salary, um, and that's just because the numbers are so clear. So this is a, a study from the Harvard group, um, interestingly all men, um, where they looked at sex differences in physician salaries in US public medical schools, taking advantage of the fact that uh, public medical schools have to make their salary data um, uh, readily available, and they found an unexplained almost $20,000 dif difference in salary. People are always like, well, of course there's a difference and it has to do with part-time work or productivity or something, um, and, um, and I'll just say that the studies right now correct pretty rigorously for all the things that you would think could be potential confounders of the relationship between gender and salary, okay? So they adjusted for all these things, um, even adjusting for clinical productivity, publication count, um, grant funding, and things like that. It was a very well-adjusted study and still found this fixed difference. Um, one question is like, was that just in academia? Um, Doximity has been doing a national survey of physicians in all practice settings. Um, this was the second year in a row they did it. So their 2018 report was looking at 2017 data. Again, pretty well adjusted for things that matter. Um, they only looked at physicians practicing at least 40 hours a week and then on top of that adjusted for hours practiced your geographic location, provider specialty, and years in practice. I thought it was pretty thoughtfully done. And after adjusting for all these things, um, female doctors earned over $100,000 less on average. And I wanna be very clear that there's not a single specialty in which women earn more than men. Not even the ones that we think of as being female dominated where all should be well because there are so many women like OB-GYN or pediatrics or family medicine. 
Um, is it happening in our specialty? It most certainly is. So um, this study is hot off the presses. It's for our women in medicine issue of academic emergency medicine. Um, there has been previously, uh, uh, previously published data on the, on the gender wage gap for academic emergency physicians. Um, this is a reboot this year and they looked at longitudinal data from the chair and administer groups of SAEM um, and looked at it in 2013, 15, 16, and 17. Uh, overall, 81 departments participated in this. Again, they adjusted for a number of institutional individual level factors, and they still found that there was a median salary difference of $12,000 favoring men, and it was not getting better over time. It was persistent over the years of this study. I will also say that the salary disparities seemed to increase as you became more senior. So it was much more pronounced um, at associate and full professor levels. And I'll say when you move up to rank, that is one opportunity to sort of look at everybody within that rank and see how salaries are distributed and if that is fair. And the conclusions of this author, are we're not taking advantage of the rank system to sort of make these comparisons and try to even out salary based on merit. I get a lot of questions about studies. Um, I'm pretty data heavy in my presentations and people want to really dissect every study. Well, I'll tell you why that study is not perfect and this one's not perfect and that was not perfect and this was not perfect and a lot of that. And I'm just, on a side note, want to make sure you guys understand how we gauge, you know, most of our practice is driven by observational studies, right? We can't randomize everything. So you guys know how we gauge the strength of a causal relationship. You know, so there are all these criteria in epidemiology. And basically, if you see a relationship that seems to be fairly consistent, no matter how you slice the data, over time in different subpopulations, adjusting for different things, and you keep on seeing the same general conclusions, you start to believe that that relationship is, is truly causal. Um, and I would say the, the relationship between gender and this salary gap is so strong, it's been so consistent over many years. I'm actually tired of salary studies being published. Um, because it's uh, at this point pretty definitive across specialties. They will keep on coming out and then we'll like wring our hands over it and move on and wait for the next one. Um, but just so you know, um, the burden of proof has been met and exceeded on this topic by every criteria. Let's talk about promotion. Um, once again, leaky pipeline um, and we know that uh, it is very hard for women to reach more senior advanced ranks. So um, in emergency medicine nationally, we just, this is double AMC data, we just have 3% who have reached full professor status. Um, we're a newer specialty, of course, but you know, internal medicine, surgery are not doing much better. They have a hard time just kind of like grazing 10% of women who reach full professor status. Whoops, sorry, I went backwards. <laughs> and again, I just wanna make it clear that even in these female dominated or very female equal fields like ob -GYN and pediatrics, they're not doing much better. It's not like all those women are just sailing through the promotions process. It is always harder for women to get ahead. Um, another, um, another study by this Harvard team, I'm fascinated by this Harvard team. They come up with all this data about, um, about a gender gap in medicine and their authorship team is all male every single time, which uh, I almost always frown upon, but I actually kind of like it, you know. Um, in this case, uh, so again, kind of thoughtfully adjusted study about um, how uh, faculty are likely to advance or not. And so this is, um, this is advancing from uh, assistant to associate or professor status over time. And the red bar is women and the blue bar is men. And I will just point out, this is kind of the trajectory for women through their careers. Um, is this is like represents kind of the crisis of the mid-career women where you've, you start out in residency. And I know a lot of you haven't really experienced any, any difference by gender that it, for me it was completely invisible until I got my first job. Um, I felt like, I was very comfortable with my male peers. I thought I was um, treated and mentored in every way um, like my male peers. And then I got my first job, negotiated my first salary, and I realized there were some differences. Um, and, and they become more market over time. And by the time you reach mid-career, that's the time when people really start reaching out for, um, uh, I guess, like women's networking groups because they're realizing there is something going on that has nothing to do with their individual performance. Um, and so that is the curve for women. I would say the classic curve, whatever you're talking about, promotion, advancement, leadership, compensation, that is our curve and it is a flattening one over time. It almost goes out without saying that there's a leadership deficit for women. Um, my friend Eleni Linos took this on in a really funny way. She was like, well, it's so obvious that there are more male chairs than women chairs, but what if we just looked at the chairs who have mustaches compared to the chairs who are women? So take this subgroup of men, 
Um, and they were really scientific about it. Whoops, sorry, I put a bar. Well, just to say that they, they took like a really rigorous approach to what is a mustache. Um, and then went on the websites of like the top 50 NIH funded medical schools and pulled up the websites um, and just looked to see if the chair had facial hair that fell into one of these categories. Um, and then looked to see when chairs were women. And they found that women were 13% of over 1,000 departmental leaders at these medical schools. And mustache leaders, can you guess? Nineteen percent. Dara did some journal club last year. Yeah, and so they they had this really funny um, like mustache ratio. Do you remember that? Where they're like, okay, so we're so far from getting equity in these top leadership positions, but can we at least get a mustache ratio of one, where like the number of women is equal to the number of mustache leaders? And you know, it like should be easier now because it's not the nineteen seventies and facial hair is like, um, unless you're in the Pacific Northwest, is not as hot as it used to be. And like they have all these like things, but I mean, basically, um, and I, I think. You know, studies like these were just designed to make fun of how far we are from, from true equity when you think of the representation of women in this field. And overall, across leadership positions, women are about 65 to 80 percent of the healthcare workforce, depending on what groups you include. Um, they're 30 percent of senior leadership positions, they're 30, 13 percent of CEOs, and they are zero percent of CEOs of Fortune 500 healthcare companies. And, um, you know, when we talk about all these differences, I guess the question just for reflection is what does that signal? You know, so if women are paid less, they are, they encounter barriers to promotion and they are rarely in leadership positions, what does that signal about women in healthcare? It is so consistent, it is so systematic, it is not by accident. So what is driving that? And what is that signal about how much we value women? All right. Um, having spoken about these topics a lot, I'll say there are generally like these frequently asked questions that all kind of get at, can we explain away these differences in ways that make us feel better? Um, so these are all brought to you by real audiences across America. Um, so very often people think it's a numbers thing, like maybe there just aren't enough women yet and when the women come, it will be great, you know? Um, and I will just point out that for two years in a row, there have been more female matriculants into medical school than men, um, so this year and last year. But for more than 25 years, we have had near equity in medical school, um, so really in the high 40 percent for women. So this is much touted, but it hasn't been far off for a long time. And so um, when I was in medical school in that heyday of like, wow, we just got equity in medical school, that was the message, was that the women are here and it will all just kind of filter up and we don't have to do much proactively. Um, and as I've shown you, a lot of these problems are not only not getting better, they seem to be widening. Um, and this is one of many studies that shows this. So this is a, an exit survey for residents in New York, um, from New York training programs. And they, um, they interviewed them about their salary entering the first jobs. And they found um, this in over a, about a 10 year study. And so first of all, the salary gap starts on first hire. And with all due respect for residents, when you have your first job, there's not much that distinguishes you um, from each other, you know, in a big way that should create a $16,000 gap. And yet that gap starts almost immediate, basically immediately upon first hire. And then over time, for all these starting salaries, again, it not only is not fixing itself, if anything, it seems to be widening over time. Okay. Um, maybe it's that women underperform. I get a lot of questions um, that are more or less that, like women deserve less pay because they are not as good clinicians, particularly right after returning from maternity leave. I get a lot of disturbing questions about, do we know that women perform well after returning from maternity leave? Um, and <laughs> I just give you this. So there's a body of data emerging. Do you guys know this study? I'll talk about it in more detail. This is like probably the most controversial thing ever published in JAMA Internal Medicine. It's those same Harvard guys. Look at those names. It's the same Harvard guys and this is an all-male publishing group again. And this time I really loved it because the results are so provocative. Um, the men had to stand up and fight for it. Um, and basically what they found was that uh, patients, this was a, um, a study of patients hospitalized uh, it, in the Medicare database, and they found that patients treated by female physicians had lower odds of death and readmission compared with patients cared for by male physicians. I will go into this a little bit more later, um, but I'll just say there's like an emerging body of data, 
and it is sad that this data needs to come out at all, but um, there, there's a lot of data sort of uh, suggesting what happens when you have more women um, in the healthcare team and suggesting that it is a good thing for patients overall and for healthcare teams. Um, this is the one I alluded to before. Maybe it's that women have different goals, like goals that it don't involve fair compensation or <laughs> promotion or leadership, um, happiness or uh, something like that. Um, and again, there is, um, there is data in many different, collected in many different ways across many different populations that suggest that women over the course of their careers have the same goals that anybody else does. Um, this one was done on case scholars, so sort of these um, sort of high intensity research scholars, but they asked them about a range of things, including their goals with research and teaching, um, international reputation, leadership positions, earning a high salary, um, as well as work-life balance. Um, the dark bar is men, the light bar is women, and overall, um, they found that the, the goals were pretty much the same, uh, regardless of if you were a man or a woman. Um, this is another one that I get all the time online and when I speak, which is just, I don't see this problem. Um, I haven't ever noticed in my 30-year career inequity or bias, so how could it exist? You know, and that's so <laughs> hard to answer. Um, and, and what I would say to that is just, um, I know privilege is kind of a buzzword, but um, Kamara Jones has this love, uh, she's a public health scholar, was the former president of the APHA, and she has this wonderful analogy that kind of hit her when she was sitting in a resident, uh, is sitting in a restaurant as a grad student where she was sitting inside with her friends eating and it was kind of a cold night and she saw the sign on the window said open and they were eating a meal, but people kept on coming by on the outside, looking in, trying the door, feeling disappointed and walking away and she was like, why don't they just come in and eat? Like they clearly want to eat and they, they're not coming in and then she was like, I'm being an idiot. The other side of the sign says closed, right? I mean, when you see a sign that is open to you and you are comfortable and things are going well, it doesn't occur to you that the people on the outside are only encountering a closed sign and they don't have access to the same things, even though for you, you think they should just walk in and grab them unless they're making a different choice. So I just think when you're comfortable, when the privilege is on your side, um, uh, you know, it is very, very hard to inhabit the other side. And I think that's why inequity and bias are so invisible to people. And I do it myself all the time. So I had a friend, after I'd been kind of posting on social media a lot, um, who said, you know, none of your posts ever take into account how much harder everything is if you have a disability. And I was totally crushed because I had never mentioned disability. And of course, like many, many, many of the things that I talk about are so much harder if you have any sort of men mental um, or, uh, or uh, other, uh, or physical uh, uh, disability. And so um, I've been much more mindful of that, but I will say it was a complete blind spot for me. I never thought about it because I don't inhabit that experience ever. Um, and so I think that's the answer to this, and, um, and it's hard to shake people out of that, but I know a lot of you are engaged in these conversations, and when you encounter that, I think that's probably the right story to tell, the right analogy to tell. Let's get into a little bit about why these inequities happen. And once again, I think some of you had this um, from Derek Hess, but I just wanna make sure for those of you who didn't get it, um, or for those of you who don't remember, that there are some like really logical underpinnings for why these things happen. Um, do you guys remember this study? This is uh, one of those landmark studies showing how sometimes these inequities in assessment and in salary can happen. Um, it's totally worth a read. I love social scientists. I think they should just come in and look at us all the time and explain why these things are happening. But in this study, it was, um, it was a study of um, about 125 science faculty in a, a range of disciplines, biology, physics, chemistry. They asked them um, to assess a potential uh, laboratory manager, a laboratory employer, and they were given one of two CVs, and the CVs were identical except for the gendered name, all right? So they were given a name that suggested they were either female or male. And they asked them to rate them on a number of factors. And so the rating bars uh, on average were are demonstrated here. The dark bars are the males and the light bars are female. And there are statistical significant differences across competence, hireability, and mentoring. Um, like would you be willing to mentor this person? And then they asked them to estimate a starting salary. What? Same person, same exact person, same data, just a different gender. And so this kind of like gives you an idea of how these things play out. But then I, you know, then you gotta wonder, so why do women automatically, without doing anything except having a, being a woman, have lower scores in these things? Like what is that all about? So why do we think that women are less competent and likable in all these things? And I think some of it comes down to these agentic versus communal traits, right? You've heard about these. 
So agentic traits are like having agency. So being assertive, competitive, having independence, courageousness, and mastery. I mean, those are all things that we value in the healthcare workforce, right? And then the communal traits are caring, sensitive, compassionate, sympathetic. And those things are nice in the healthcare workforce too, right? You know, like when you want an ER resident and a faculty member and a leader, it's really great if they're these things, but I think our stereotypic notion of physicians, particularly those in fields like ours where we have to make decisions fast and work in these chaotic environments, we really favor agentic traits and we really favor agentic traits in our top leaders, you know? So that creates this kind of dilemma for women because we are in an environment where agentic traits are highly valued, highly rewarded, highly reinforced in general, but when a woman is agentic, she is penalized because a woman is supposed to be communal, right? Um, the jam, the cookie baking, right? Like women are there to be warm and supportive and it's a little weird when you have an agentic woman and people kind of recoil from that and they say something about her is off. She's really bitchy. Can I say that in a recorded grand rounds? She's really bossy. She's really shrill, you know, like all these negative connotations come in. So what does a high achieving woman do when she's criticized for being too agentic? Yeah, you dial it down. You kind of like censor yourself a little bit. And so you behave more communally, you know? And I've seen women who are like, I'm gonna give more hugs and I'm gonna bring cookies in every shift. Um, I had a cookie baking period too, because that allowed me to be a little more assertive in, the, in different areas of my life. Um, and then what happens when you go up for a leadership position or career advancement? People say, you don't really have leadership characteristics we're looking for, you know? So it just becomes a trap in some ways that does not allow women to go forward. And as far as like the, the communal expectations, there's actually a study, it was a qualitative study of internal medicine residents where they interviewed them after they ran codes. And I thought it was like the best description of, of how hard it is to cope with gendered expectations. Um, one resident said, um, I run a code successfully and then I feel like I have to go around the room and apologize to everybody for my behavior. Um, and it just made me feel so sad for residents, you know, because I think rather than trying to navigate that tightrope of like being agentic enough to be effective in your clinical care, but not so agentic that everyone hates you, it's like that the mental and emotional energy that comes to walking that tightrope makes me feel tired thinking about it and I wish we could just empower our female physicians to just learn clinical medicine and put all their mental and emotional energy into being a great doctor rather than trying to navigate some of these really complicated dynamics that we set up, all right? It's not just gender bias. So I wanna give you a hypothetical scenario. It might be real, might not. Um, so there's, let's say there's a 40 year old physician, 10 years out from residency, um, early career, very promising educator, won a teaching award actually. Um, one of the favorite teaching faculty in that department and then in quick succession had several young children. It's the age old story. This will happen to many of you, I promise. Um, and so because of that, left academia for part time community work for about six years and now wants to uh, re-enter academia. So they are applying for this position in your department. Um, you, uh, they're actually applying for like a teaching role in one of the community hospitals but wants to be engaged in um, in teaching residents and you know, conference and things like that. Um, but they're also open to leadership roles. Um, and these are the roles that you have available in your department. Um, so you have a part-time clinical teaching role um, with an option to transition them to full-time clinical teaching faculty at a later date once they've kind of proved that they're really into it now. You can give them a full-time clinical educator position that they're applying for saying they had early promise, they have great experience in the community, they clearly wanna come back. You can give them a section chief role, that is open and they would be interested in that if that was something um, available to them. Or you just pass on this candidate. You have a pile of applications on your desk from new grads, people, and people who have never left for community practice. So how many would do A? I'm not gonna judge you at all, okay? All right. How many would do B? How many would do C? A lot of potential, just escalate them. How many would do none of the above and pass on this candidate? Anybody? I will tell you honestly, I, I personally would probably do A. They, they feel a little untested to me for like full-time academia work. I thought, I thought A was really reasonable. So this person is my husband um, and this is what happened. And he's a smart guy and he deserves that completely. However, it also made me mad because this narrative 
Never in the history of jobs or women has this ever happened to a woman. You do not leave to spend more time with your kids and go to part-time community work and come back into a section chief role, not right away. You might come in, get tested, and work your way up there. But the automatic assumption that this guy is ready to go in a section chief role is it's unheard of for women. Um, and why is that? And this is a studied thing. Okay, so this is called the motherhood penalty. So in this study, the study participants read a description of a company hiring for a mid-level marketing position. They examined application materials for two hypothetical applicants, and these were designed very carefully to be similar in all aspects except for parental status. They just put this little cue at the bottom when it was under like uh, activities that said, I'm in the PTA or I'm not in the PTA. All right, and that was the only difference between these two applicants. And in this study, they're just comparing women versus women and men versus men, not across genders, okay? And so um, what do you think happened in the ratings for women who were mothers versus non-mothers? So they rated them on competence, commitment, the percent score required on an exam, which is kind of like, what's the threshold exam for them to be a candidate for this job? Um, the salary, proportion recommended for a management position, likelihood of promotion, and promotion recommended for hire. So if you can read the numbers, you'll see um, for a mother versus a non-mother, everything gets worse, including an increased score, threshold score required in an exam for you to be considered for this position, and a decreased salary, okay? What about fathers versus non-fathers? Can you see? So for fathers versus non-fathers, almost everything goes up. Why is that? Fathers are great guys, right? They're like babysitting their kids, and they are, they're like more, they're better somehow, and they have to support their families. And so um, fathers come with this like sheen of being a great, dependable, reliable, great guy. Mothers come with this sheen of she is unlikely to be committed because she's distracted by her home responsibilities. Um, and I just point this out because I think there are times where like, you know, we're kind of used to the gender gap discussion, like, yeah, it kind of sucks to be a woman or whatever, but I think there are these subcategories where, um, where if you layer on certain characteristics on top of gender, it really widens the disparity because it accelerates men while it pulls women down, all right? So the gender thing is easy to talk about because it's the biggest, grossest difference, but I think there's a lot of complexity that's in here and sometimes it makes things better and sometimes it makes things even worse than we think, all right? Um, this is a study I did in JAMA Internal Medicine where we asked um, a large cohort of women about their experiences with general gender discrimination and also with specifically maternal discrimination. And we found that maternal discrimination was an overlapping but actually separate experience, that there were distinct experiences that had to do with not just motherhood but your potential to be a mother where it is assumed that that your parenting status will influence your work at some later date. Um, there was a paired qualitative study that was out in Christmas BMJ as well. Um, but what this study um, showed to me was uh, we also looked did a sub-analysis where we looked at if you experienced um, discrimination in that way, uh, what happened to your burnout scores? And we found that burnout was associated with experiences of discrimination for women. So going back to this, when I, taking all of that into account, right, the sexual harassment, the, the disparities that we see in almost every domain of advancement and reward in healthcare, and then you look at this, and I have a very hard time seeing this as a lifestyle choice. Does that make sense to you? When I review all that data, and then I look at the leaky pipeline, I see this as a perfectly expected symptom of the system that we have. And to call it a choice is, is super insulting and it's also bearing all the problems that we have in healthcare. Is that fair? So here's the case for equity. Um, and it's not just to give us the warm touchy feelies because um, I know this feels like a touchy feely topic. I actually think that it is better for our workforce and it is better for our patients and this is why. Um, there's a very strong business case for equity that's emerging, and I think the corporate world understands this much better than we in healthcare do. But the healthcare data is coming out too. Um, but I love the data from, um, from McKinsey series. So th they have this ongoing series annual that comes out. It's an increasingly large database of, st of, of companies across industries and across countries where they just sort of collect data on, their, um, on the makeup of their workforce and how that is related to their financial outcomes. And what they found that companies that are in the top quartile for gender diversity in both their workforce and their leadership 
are 15% more likely to have financial returns above the national industry mean. And conversely, if you're in the bottom quartile for gender diversity, you're statistically less likely to achieve above average financial returns. And their conclusion overall is that across companies, diversity is a competitive differentiator, shifting market share towards more diverse companies. So my brother works for Accenture, um, and I have a very good friend in McKinsey who left medicine, went to McKinsey, and then came back to medicine. And both of them are shocked by how little we talk about diversity as, a, as kind of a major initiative that is expected to improve the financial returns of our workplaces. Um, this is not a soft thing. It's not an optional thing in corporate America. They're taking it very seriously because they see the impact on their bottom line. And I would argue that in healthcare, we have a dual bottom line. Of course, it's all about money, but of course, we also want safe and equitable and high quality clinical care. And this is the emerging data that I'm talking about. So I, I mentioned this study already. So this study was so brilliantly done. It was a large database of Medicare patients who came into the hospital and then were essentially randomized to either a male or a female hospitalist. Because you don't come in and say, I'd like the female hospitalist today or male hospitalist, it's just whoever's on, right? And so it's a quasi-randomized study. Um, and they just followed the patients out for, um, for outcomes including cardiac, morbidity, um, death, <laughs> and 30-day and readmission compared with patients cared for by male physicians. And you know, the, the vast majority of this sort of like uh, uh, physician gender research is like, you know, were you happier if you had a female physician or, you know, did you like having whatever? This one's like, did you die? Like they just went for it completely. <laughs> That's my admiration about this study. And, and they actually found, and they did a lot of really sophisticated sub-analyses, like they're like, men are more likely to be intensive care unit doctors, so we should cut out the ICU patients, and many, many more really thoughtful sub-analyses. And basically, pretty consistently across all their um, clinical, very key clinical outcomes, they found that patients treated by female physicians, as their attending of note, had lower odds of death and readmission. Um, I'll come back to what that means in a second. I just want to point out that a uh, very similar study in, in the uh, large database, uh, Ontario patients admitted for one of 25 key surgical um, procedures had very similar things, lower odds of death at 30 days post-op and no difference in length of stay, complications or readmission rates. Um, and then finally, something for our own specialty. Um, this was a study published in, um, in PNAS, a, a, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, where they looked at patient-physician gender concordance among patients who come in for MI. And so, um, and they're looking at the treating emergency department doctor, not cardiologist, okay? So this is a large database of Florida hospitals, and they just looked at how the gender matched. So if a, the first thing is like gender of the physician to a patient. So if a male, and this is survival, Okay, again, not a wimpy outcome, um, survival. <laughs> um, so male treating a female patient, survival's decreased. Male treating a male uh, patient is what's kind of like the comparator. And then female treating a female patient, um, survival is increased. And um, the really interesting thing was not just that women provide female heart attack patients with better care and increased odds of survival. Um, they then just looked across emergency departments, and they looked for the proportion of physicians in each group who were female. And they found that female patients had overall had better outcomes in EDs that have a higher percentage of female physicians. So like the entire group did better for female patients if there were more women in the group. And that relationship was particularly true for patients treated by male physicians. In other words, the performance of male physicians was pulled up by a higher proportion of women in that group. And they have a lot of hypotheses for why that was. Like maybe the women, somehow the knowledge is, is bleeding out to the whole group, right? Maybe the women are more outspoken about gender-based biases that might affect heart attack patients. Maybe they're working with the nurses to create pathways for female heart, uh, chest pain patients. Um, maybe it's just like discussion in their attending meetings. Whatever it is, there's something about having more women in the group that seems to perform the, improve the performance of everyone. Um, and I thought that was such an elegant and nice way to look at the data because, I mean, do we think that women are better physicians from these studies? Nobody thinks that, right? There's no mechanism to say that women are better physicians than men. Um, and that's not the premise for any of these studies, actually. All the studies are, are predicated on the assumption that men might be better than women. Um, and what they're finding is kind of a surprising other thing. But I think what it is, what these studies are showing is that if there's a female physician who is the lead of a team, that team is automatically more diverse 
than your standard medical team. And I think we know from social science studies and studies of organizational psychology that, that collective intelligence is increased by diversity. And I think that is what is reflected here. It's not the one person. We all work in teams, particularly in our field, right? And I think having this marker of increased diversity is what is improving the collective intelligence of this entire group. Does that make sense? So I go back to the NASEM report. Um, so I mentioned before that sexual harassment has a higher relationship with women's well-being than any other factor. What I didn't mention yet, and I think is an important conclusion of this study, is not just that we lose the talent from women, but actually the negative effects of harassment aren't just on the target of harassment. It bleeds out to the entire organization, to the witnesses of the harassment, to the working groups those women are in, the divisions, the departments, and actually entire organizations are poisoned by the experience of sexual harassment. So when I give this talk, a lot of people will hear that I'm advocating for better workplace for women. And I am, of course, and changes to equity and to safety in our workplace are certainly good for women. But the bigger point is that it's good for the entire healthcare team. These things affect everybody, man, women, everybody. Um, and it's also, it's good for our business. And ultimately, because our business is the provision of healthcare, it's gonna be good for our patients. So the idea that we can work in a healthcare system where there is severe inequity and harassment, and then we walk through a door and we give our patients perfectly equitable and safe care, that is a construct that makes no sense to me, right? So I think we need to start with our own house, clean our own house so that when other people come to our house, um, it is better for them. And that is ultimately um, the big idea, uh, the big suggestion that I have for healthcare. So what do we do? I gave you a lot of information about the problem. So let's spend the last couple of minutes talking about some solutions. And I will say, this is not one of them. And this is from, this is a joke, but it is very real in that there was a lot of, that for a long time there were a lot of faculty development sessions and things published that coached women how to behave like men. So then we got into those things. I went to like a million of them and then I would come back and my chair would be like, did you go to one of those workshops where they tell you how to behave like men because you're just acting really weird? Can you just tell me what you want? I mean, these things do not work because it's ridiculous, you know? And I think really the idea is to move beyond, um, uh, to move beyond thinking of like individual cases or, um, you know, uh, coaching individuals to fix the problem for themselves. I think we need to start thinking about this much more broadly um, because it's been so consistent. So first of all, I think um, the big fixes I would say in large categories are a, we need to recognize this as an everyone problem rather than saying women need to join in women's groups and fix it for the women. That, like, that's not how things work. Um, I think we really need to invest in this as an everyone problem since everyone will benefit from the work of equity and safety. We need to recognize this as an organizational problem. So particularly with regards to sexual harassment, when a case comes to light, everyone's like, what is wrong with that jerk? But the truth is that jerk thrived in an environment that perpetuated the harassment often for many years um, before it comes to light. So those things should be like what we do for M&M. Like when we come to M&M, we're not like what's wrong with that doctor that that happened, right? We pivot pretty quickly to the systems issues be that allowed all those like holes in the Swiss cheese so that that bad case could have played out and we try to fix it on a system level so it can't happen again. And that's how we need to respond to individual cases of harassment or discrimination. We obviously need to aim much higher than avoidance of litigation that is a subterranean goal to reach for organizations. I think we can actually aim for improving the workplace for our physicians and nurses and the entire workforce um, and passing that on to patients. We cannot solve this unless we measure it. So I think measurement, I am a little obsessed with metrics, but there are validated instruments out there um, that will help us track these problems and we need to vastly improve both our qualitative and quantitative understanding of the problem so that we can set targets and then we can prove that we have achieved those targets. I think we need to stop talking about fairness and being nice. We need to talk about this as a strong business case for, for, um, for diversity and inclusion. And then the last thing I'll say is perfectly smart physicians who solve clinical problems all the time do not need to be helpless when it comes to the problem of sexual harassment and inequity. We have entire frameworks for solving problems on a broad institutional level. And I think we need to apply those same quality improvement approaches to this problem as well. And just as one example, I mean, we have the Donabedian framework. Is that something that's familiar to people at all? 
So this whole data obedient framework for, for quality improvement. Um, and it entails um, making sure that you have the structures, processes, and outcomes in place to actually affect change. So as an example, say you as an institution want to improve your treatment of a CHF patient because your metrics are bad, they're dying, you know, we're not getting the full reimbursement from insurance for evidence-based care or what, for meeting their quality metrics or whatever. So we, we say we want to be like a, a center for excellence for CHF. We make sure that we have the structures in place, right? So we have enough cardiologists, enough beds in the CCU um, and telemetry beds on the floor that we have pathways to treat them and algorithms for when you give what medications. Um, we have tons of support staff for these type of patients. Maybe we even have like a, you know, a cardiac area of our emergency department where, where the nurses and the mid-levels know to go through those pathways. Um, and so we put all the sort of structures in place to be able to treat these patients. And then we look at our process measures. Are we actually implementing the policies and the pathways? Are we doing it quickly? Um, you know, we put all these process measures in place. How quickly are patients being triaged to the right area? How quickly are they being identified? How often are we using the pathways? How often do they get uh, to the bed that they should be assigned to and, and quickly? And we, we make sure that we're actually implementing the structures in the way that we should. And then we set outcomes, right? We set clinical outcomes like, what are the outcomes for these patients? What's their length of stay? What's the cost devoted to their care? Do they die? Um, you know, how often do they have 30-day bounce backs or whatever? Um, and we go through this process of refinement iteratively until we have the best treatment for our CHF patients and we brag about it to our community and to the public, right? It doesn't sound like a familiar process. We do it for stroke centers of care. We do it whenever we've identified an area where we need to do better. I see it all the time. It's like as soon as we get money for something, like we need to improve on the quality and measure for time to antibiotics, right? Or time to your full 30 cc's per kilo for septic patients. We, we do it all the time where we put, we put in all the structures and the education um, needed in order to solve a problem. And this is all that we need to do for sexual harassment and inequity. And I will say, um, the response for most institutions is doing entry level sexual harassment training um, and having an office for complaints that nobody uses and having a policy in place that nobody knows how to find. We are stalled on inadequate structures. It is very rare that I've heard about process measures or outcomes, sorry, um, and it is very rare that we're rigorously measuring outcomes or even defining what outcomes we're interested in. Right? So we just need to do what we do all the time. So here's my big idea for medicine and science. To fix harassment, we need to establish equity across the board in all these pro uh, domains. To fix equity, we need to address harassment so that we don't have the leaky pipeline, and this needs to happen as soon as possible. Um, and I really think that as we talk about these, we should not talk about them with any sort of emotion or um, defensiveness, but really uh, uh, approach these efforts as the smart business and healthcare investments that they are.